No mai, haere mai. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, ko Jeff Toko Ingoa. Um, a warm welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, I'm Jeff Ford. Uh, I'm a lecturer in digital humanities at Te Whare Wananga o Waitaha, uh, the University of uh, Canterbury. Um, I'm very pleased to chair this stream today. We've got some great papers showing off different applications of language analysis. So uh, we've got uh, Joshua Black uh, on philosophical writing in early New Zealand newspapers, which was name checked in the last uh, session uh, from Rachel Eason. Uh, then we've got Hunter Hatfield and Michael Kopp uh, on finding novel ideas and writing through computational graph theoretic analysis. And Elaine Moody uh, on sentiment and topics and letters written by 19th century immigrants in North America. So we'll go uh, in the order of the program. Uh, Josh Hunter and Michael are presenting uh, long papers. And so they'll talk for uh, 25 minutes and Elaine will talk for 10 minutes. Um, We'll keep our question time to the end. So please uh, uh, take notes as, as we go, uh, note down your questions. You can use the chat for this if you like. Um, everyone started the session today with their cameras off. Uh, I'd invite you all to uh, turn on your cameras now if you want the presenters to see your uh, smiling, friendly faces. H um, however, do uh, whatever you feel comfortable with with Zoom, that's all, all good. So uh, let's get into the presentations. First up, we have uh, Joshua Black from the New Zealand Institute of Language, Brain and Behaviour at Te Whare, Whare Wananga o Waitaha, the University of Canterbury. Thanks, Josh. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, Josh, uh, yeah, based here at the University of Canterbury. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here. Um, and so my main work currently is, um, is on language processing, but it's sort of processing of... Um, uh, vowels in New Zealand English and how they um, uh, sort of correlate with one another and work in structures together. Um, but that's not the, um, the material I'm presenting here. So this is coming out of a, um, a summer project I did last summer um, uh, as part of a um, data science project, uh, sorry, um, a program at um, Canterbury here. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge um, Jeff, uh, who um, helped to supervise that, and um, also uh, Ben Adams in um, computer science here. Uh, so I've got some links here, which I believe Chris will be sending out in the chat uh, that I'd just like to draw your attention to. So the first is a, um, I'll make reference to some Jupyter notebooks associated with this project. And so they're all available at the, the GitHub repository there. And then there's also a, um, a dashboard that I've produced that, um, enables you to play around with um, some of the things I'll be talking about. So, there we go, we're moving. Here's an overview. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, so th this talk primarily deals with kind of a method for constructing a corpus from uh, a digitized um, sort of historical newspaper data set. Um, but I will say a little bit initially about the more specific sort of case study that motivated me, um, which is looking at um, philosophical discourse in New Zealand newspapers. Uh, then I wanna say a little bit uh, more broadly, a kind of methodological motivation that might apply to multiple digital humanities projects. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the specific problem of creating a kind of specialized corpus uh, from newspapers. Uh, and then offer my sort of, gen sort of big picture kind of solution to it, which I'm kind of uh, excessively fancily calling an iterative bootstrapping process, um, where we sort of have candidate corpuses, we evaluate them, we hand label items, then we train a text classifier, which produces our new candidate corpus, and we go around in this cycle. Uh, and then I'm just very quickly, I'm going to sort of show something of um, what that might say in the specific corpus that I, I've generated. Uh, so in terms of philosophy in New Zealand newspapers, uh, if you pick up a kind of history of you know, academic philosophy in, um, in New Zealand, you're not going to get much before the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and so you'll get a line like this. Many of those who had long-standing chairs published next to nothing. So that's um, one gap. We sort of start our story which in a place that seemed sort of quite late to me. Um, I should add... Uh, 
my um, academic background is in philosophy, um, and I've been quite interested in um, sort of 19th century philosophy, sort of in general. Um, so that that's one gap, though, anyway, a gap in, in New Zealand specifically. And then I suppose there's another gap in history of philosophy in general, which is um, what you might get if you broadened the net to look outside of academic publications. And so newspapers seem like a, a plausible place to find that. Um, and indeed, in the New Zealand context, um, a historian of, um, of uh, New Zealand, uh, early New Zealand history has said that newspapers were the fundamental infrastructure for intellectual life here. And in part, that's just economic, you know. Um, it costs a lot to have a, a scholarly journal or to publish monographs. Uh, and yes, indeed, we get the, the wider class of um, contributors. And it was also um, motivated by the fact that the National Library had, have done this open data pilot, which you'll have heard about at the previous uh, um, session, if you were there. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge them and, and thank them for, for doing that. Um, and so this is a pre-1900 collection of English language, New Zealand newspaper content. Uh, and this, I just wanted to show a kind of example of the kind of stuff that was of interest to me when I was just kind of poking around in the data set. Um, this is um, a, a report of a public debate um, that happened in um, Oxford, which is not Oxford in, in the UK, but is just um, a few kilometers north of Christchurch, very small town. Um, and so you're getting in the newspapers reports of these kind of public events that are actually doing some fairly hardcore philosophy. But that's just one example. Now, in terms of the broader methodological set of questions, um, uh, there's a whole series of, um, there's a literature, I suppose, um, that is engaging with this question. It's sort of core digital humanities literature about how the methodology of kind of historical disciplines uh, should change um, now that we have these OCR generated digital archives. Um, and one thing that you, one thread in that literature is a kind of widespread dissatisfaction with um, keyword searches. Um, so we get, you know, claims like, you know, the result of a keyword search only lets you make a kind of existence proof argument. Look, in this corpus, there's this thing, but it doesn't tell you how sort of representative it is in a way that, say, a more uh, thorough sort of engagement with a physical archive would. Um, and, you know, in general, that's a kind of a question about context um, and how we contextualize the material that it, it's so easy to just sort of cherry pick with um, kind of keyword search approaches. Uh, OCR as well, so optical character recognition means uh, which powers our ability to search through these archives um, will have a sort of an unclear to, to the researcher collection of material that isn't actually available to be searched. So you might make some claim that there's no um, instance of this word in this sort of data set or whatever, that might just be because, you know, you were unlucky with the um, optical character recognition. Uh, and a, another one is that sort of traditional citation practices now sort of seem to be a bit deceptive. So even if you find something by sort of keyword searching a, a large corpus, you'll cite the physical thing. Um, and it will look like you've engaged in this more traditional kind of immersive reading practice. Um, so there's been a big shift in what people do in the kind of historical sciences, but it's not um, necessarily clear if you just read the publications, they look the same as, as that objection. Uh, and so the same literature that I'm talking about in digital humanities seems to call for a different orientation. And it seems like the underlying question is, you know, what can we do now that we couldn't do before? Uh, you get references to a kind of source as data approach where sort of data just means something like computer processable information. Um, and the thought here seems to be that um, uh, going deeper into the sort of digital side of digital you know, humanities is what might help to provide the context that we're after in a new way. Um, and so you get this line to move from piles of books to subtle maps of meaning. And so this, this project here is kind of an experiment in how you might carry out that, that orientation, as I'm sure the other things will hear in this panel as well. Ah. 
So um, the uh, Open Data Pilot um, the, in the National Library of New Zealand released um, uh, all of their pre-1900 content or, or pretty much all of it. Um, uh, has about 1.5 million pages of uh, newspaper material. Um, and it's uh, 315 gigabytes kind of compressed. Now, it seems like the definition of big data is, um, does it fit on one computer or not? Um, and in this case, you know, it does kind of fit in one computer. So it's not big data in like the, the strict sense, but um, it's pretty big for, <laughs> um, the average computer to, to work with. Now, a key point is that um, if we just start trying to do text mining on the full data set, um, this question about philosophical discourse is unlikely to be resolved. So it seems like, uh, you know, it's just such a small fraction of newspaper content that it would be very hard to, to find it. Um, and indeed the final corpus that I produced using this method is 0.4% of the data set, which is still actually quite a lot. Um, but it's a general problem here. So we wanna create specialist corpora for, um, from digital newspaper archives. Um, and given what we've seen before from the, the digital humanities literature, um, we wanna avoid these problems of keyword searching and um, we don't want to um, rely on having accurate OCR for sort of every word when we do this. Um, there's also a, a sort of push towards Kind of public availability and in, in that light i've got these jupyter notebooks um, that you should see the links to um, in the chat and also um, the dashboard so um here's the kind of the big picture of the the approach we've got our raw data we have to pre-process it and then the iterative bit is just that there's these loops that you can keep going around so um i'm going to talk about each stage individually so i won't say much about each of them here, but this just gives the kind of overview. Um, we're wanting to explore a candidate corpus, label articles as either desired or not desired, um, train a classifier on those labels, then apply that classifier to the whole data set to produce a new candidate corpus. So um, just a few words on the pre-processing. Um, uh, the data comes in this Metzelto XML format, which is, um, quite widespread in newspaper digitization. And so hopefully what I've done here can be applied in, in other contexts. And the basic idea of this format is that you have a, a physical and logical description of each issue. So the MITS uh, file tells you, you know, this is all the articles and advertisements in, the, in this issue. Um, and here's the different pages where they're sort of split onto. Um, and so we can basically just iterate through each issue um, pick up a list of all the articles and where we need to find the text for them. And so we're actually, here I'm just going for sort of plain text. So we're throwing away a huge amount of information, including you know, where on the page each word is. Um, and I've excluded advertisements in this case, um, which you know actually could be quite interesting for exploring philosophical discourse here because they have advertisements of lectures and little descriptions of what, what the lectures are but that's for future work. Um, so anyway, we come down from 300 and whatever gigabytes to about eight gigabytes, and we've got 7.6 million items in our, um, our initial data set. So the corpus exploration stage, um, we're supposed to start with the candidate corpus um, and then sort of work out whether it's satisfactory, but we don't have one at the start um, and the whole data sets going to be very unlikely to work. So our old friend keyword searching can come in here. And the, what I started with was just um, matches for philoso. So philosophy, philosopher, like all, all of those words. And that that's the initial kind of candidate corpus. Uh, and so in the, the notebook that I've um, attached to this, um, the, the, the link is there in the chat. Um, there's various options for sort of exploring the candidate corpus, including you know manual inspection of a random collection, so just sampling it and reading, um, and then standard kind of uh, text mining approaches, concordance and collocations. Um, we also have um, LDA topic modeling there, um, but I'm just going to talk about co-occurrence networks for time. Um, so this is a kind of way of statistically kind of ranking. 
um, terms that appear together in the same item. Uh, and rather than talking uh, too much about that, I'll just show you an example using um, the online page. Uh, so, Here we go. So these are sort of pre-generated. They can actually take quite a while to load, but this is a co-occurrence network for the word ethics that comes from the corpus of just keyword search results for philosophy. And so what this is giving us is the 15 words that are most closely um, sort of statistically interestingly <laughs> um, uh, associated with uh, the word ethics in the corpus and then five of the five words that are most closely related with those words. So primary and secondary co-occurrences. And so already you're seeing something about how ethics is thought of here. We've got sciences, we've got more classic philosophy. Um, we've got issues like prostitution um, coming up there um, and uh, the idea of say naturalism. So already we've, we've got something interesting happening here. Um, and I can just switch to the, the later corpus. Um, and you can see that you can just increase the number of uh, things here. So this will look quite frightening initially. <laughs> so here we have these just big networks of how um, a word like ethics is being uh, thought of here. Um, but of course, a lot of interpretation would need to go into doing that in detail, but we're, we're learning something about um, this corpus. So I'll cut back to the presentation. So basically at the end of this stage, uh, the question is just, is this corpus good enough for our pro, uh, sort of uh, for what we wanna do? Um, are there lots of unwanted items? Are there themes in what the un unwanted items are? Often I found in the initial corpus, say philosophical is used um, in fictional context as a way of sort of describing the fact that some character in a bit of fiction is kind of resigned to things. So you want, I wanna get rid of that kind of thing from my, my corpus. Um, and so throughout this stage, we've got the labeling stage in mind, which is like, we're keeping notes of which kind of articles we want. There is no pain-free way to do labeling. It's just hard work. Um, and uh, so basically we need a labeling scheme for items here. Uh, and this project that I've done was just a really quite a vague labeling scheme, which I actually, I think is interesting because we, we still get you know, good results from it, I think, but I, I adopted a kind of broad definition. Uh, does it argue for or appeal to ideas of ultimate reality or ultimate value? Um, you know, I think, yeah, it's probably worth not um, going into lots of examples of that because unpeeling the what is philosophy sort of uh, or opening that sort of can of worms is usually a way to spend 25 minutes at least. Um, but we can talk about that in the questions maybe. And then also various other labels, um, which uh, can help you to interpret the results. And so again, we've got another a dashboard for this, um, which I can show you. So basically a series of items with the plain text and then um, opportunities to label or not. So I don't know, I'm not looking at this, but here's some some labeling, you know, um, and you update it and it, uh, eventually your, your collection builds up. Uh, and so then we get to the stage of uh, training and applying a classifier. Um, we end up, oh, sorry, I, I've ended up using a very simple approach, which is just, we're representing these documents as uh, words and how often the word appears. Uh, and we're using a naive Bayes classifier. Um, more sophisticated methods uh, often seem to rely on having high quality sequence data. And in a situation in which you've even got, you know, 85% quality OCR, that can even be um, a problem. Uh, so we just want a kind of simple representation. Um, and the only thing I'm gonna highlight here is that once we've trained a model, um, and again, details in the, in the Jupyter notebooks and the, the GitHub repository, our evaluation of it is both quantitative in terms of like various metrics associated with you know accuracy and whatnot, and qualitative. So we don't want to treat the model as just a kind of black box. We want to be able to sort of 
open it up and see what's going on inside it um, and what that might mean for the corpus that it, it generates. And so, as I've said before, once you've got a model, you create a new candidate corpus by just applying it to the, the whole data set and keeping the, the philosophy um, items in this case. So iterative bootstrapping, just we start with nothing and we label and go around to create new candidate corpora. And as we go, we're getting closer and closer to um, the material that we want. Because of course, after you've gone through the first approach, then you've got just items that your initial classifier thinks are philosophy. And if there's a whole lot of stuff in there that you don't want, then the fact that you're labeling that as unwanted means that you're getting closer and closer to um, uh, what you want in your final corpus. So some quick results just to summarize. Um, here, um, we're looking at the number of items labeled. And in particular, I wanna draw your attention to the philosophy label. So first iteration round, sort of 100 and 150. Uh, so 100 you know, philosophy items. Second time around 300 and 620 that aren't. Um, and uh, in terms of model metrics, this is the second, this is a, a, the results from the sort of test set that you hold out for, for classification. Uh, and we're getting about uh, 14 um, uh, false positives and 15 um, false negatives uh, and an accurate rate of you know, about 90%. But as I said before, the really interesting thing is which are the, the false negatives? So, um, and in this case, I'll just highlight the fact that when I looked through the false negatives of this one, a lot of them were um, composite items. So these are editorials and things like that in which many topics are covered within the same piece. And they're often you know, quite long. And it, as a, a, on the humanistic level, it's important to say that um, you know, if you're drawing any conclusions from the corpus, as I hope to, um, uh, knowing that there's a possible class of perspectives there that might be missing is really important. Um, and I also just wanted to show the um, uh, terms which the model is using. Um, so it's a very simple model, it just assigns a probability of being philosophy or not philosophy on the basis of the appearance of, of terms. Uh, and so I've got here um, uh, just the top 50 or so words. So you see God, science, nature, religion, evil, world, moral, existence. Now the intro philosophy paper here at Canterbury used to be called God, Mind and Freedom. So I mean, we've got at least two of those there, um, but that just shows you what features are actually being picked out here. Um, so let me just um, speed through. Uh, so great, I see the five minute warning. Uh, and look at some uh, sample um, co-occurrence networks. Uh, and so this is just a, a sense of what you might learn about philosophical discussion from what I've done here. And I'm just again, focusing on co-occurrence networks. So say you're interested in how evolution is being discussed. Well, here's a co-occurrence network where I've highlighted some things. Um, so you probably wouldn't be surprised to find Darwin and um, someone like Huxley associated and to see sort of scientific language and maybe theological language there. What I'd highlight is that um, names like Salmond coming up high or, or this one Parker here, that'd be things that you might be interested in figuring out what that's about. And in fact, that does show some of the New Zealand context of these debates. Um, so it turns out Salmond was the, the first, or I think second philosopher um, employed, professional philosopher in, in New Zealand. And Parker was also a professor in Otago. And so then we can just do the same thing for those names. Well, Salmon, we see very quickly Synod, Presbyterian, Presbytery. We see material that sort of indicates sort of modes of publication of ideas. Um, so already you can see something about um, this character in, in New Zealand philosophy. Um, then Parker, quite a different network birds, biological, you can already get the sense that this is um, possibly someone who's much more involved in the sciences. Uh, and so already we're getting some kind of idea of the context in which certain debates were carried out that could then help to situate our more um, 
close up engagement with um with these texts or, or debates. Uh, and I'll I'll just skip these um, for reasons of time, um, and just say a little bit just to wrap up, which is. So what I've covered here is um, a sort of quick overview of what I think is a general method for producing specialized corpora from large digitized newspaper archives. Um, and we've had an even quicker look just then within a few minutes of um, uh, what the philosophy corpus might say about you know, one issue um, that was live at, at the time um, and showing us some of the specifically New Zealand, um, the way it was carried out in New Zealand specifically. Um, see the GitHub repository for more details. Um, and also, um, yes, we should sort of reflect a bit on whether we've got anywhere beyond keyword searching here. So certainly we've placed this query about evolution within a wider context of discussion. Uh, we've seen though that we still need to be quite careful about the conclusions we draw on the basis of our evalu qualitative evaluation of the model. We know that you know editorials, for instance, aren't coming through um, necessarily as well as other kinds of newspaper material. Um, and I, I would suggest that this is at least some pro progress towards this idea of um, uh, generating networks of meaning out of um, these kind of large digital archives. And so I'll, um, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. But um, Namihi Nui, thanks very much. Thanks for that, Josh. Um, a reminder that uh, we'll save questions uh, at the end for those who uh, have joined us uh, through uh, Josh's talk. Uh, so if you have questions for Josh, uh, please note them down and, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll address them um, uh, at the end of, of the session. But uh, next up, we have uh, Hunter Hatfield and Michael Kopp uh, from the, the English and Linguistics Program. Uh, te Fare Wananga o Otago, uh, the University of Otago, and over to you, uh, Hunter and Michael. Tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Uh, before we start today, let's see if I can get the screen share going. There we go. Uh, on our presentation, obviously, on finding novel ideas and writing through computational graph theoretic analysis. Uh, I'm Michael, and this is Hunter, by the way. Um, we'd like to thank a few, a few of the grants that have sustained this research for the last little bit. Uh, the University of Otago Improvement Grant, uh, University of Otago Research Grant, uh, Marsden Near Miss Grant, and our present grant, which is the CALT Grant. Thank you, Otago. Uh, we'd also like to thank our research assistants, uh, Jemima Lomax-Sawyers for her R coding, and Caleb Whelan and Lisa Moore for their transcription, uh, without whom we wouldn't be able to do this initial these uh, initial da data. We'll do uh, this. Will be two parts. I'll do the introduction, just bringing you up to date where our data came from, a bit about some of our previous research. I'll probably take about six minutes, seven minutes, and then we'll move to Hunter and finding novel ideas. So the goals of our research in general is uh, to think about a novelty in writing. So when a group of people discuss a topic, how much variation in ideas occur? These are our general research questions. What factors increase variation? And, and of course, in a cluttered informational landscape, how might we search computationally for novel ideas? So where does our data come from? Well, each, uh, each year there are about 1400 health sciences first year students that enter Otago. And this is a very competitive program, uh, highly motivated students. They're trying to get into medicine, dentistry, physiotherapy, uh, pharmacy and medical health laboratory uh, science. So we, be, we started taking this English diagnostic test and uh, looking at the data, seeing what we could find from them find from it that would tell us something about our students. And it took us in a variety of directions. It's a, gi it's a gigantic data set now. We have about 13, 13 to 14,000 tests, which is about 11,000 unique students. So the test itself is a three section test and each section is worth 10 marks. This isn't a test like IELTS that you might be, uh, though it does have similar properties, it's meant to identify students who might be struggling with their studies at university. So it's meant to help students. So there are three sections, a reading comprehension, and this is where we focused most of our attention before because it was highly predictive of their success elsewhere at university. Listening comprehension, 
doesn't tell us very much. And the essay is where we're focusing now. So what is the essay? They, are, they receive an article on this test. It's between 300 and 500 words. And then they're asked to write a short essay in response to that article usually, uh, with a word range of about 200 to 250 words. Now, in terms of novelty, one of the things that happens is they're allowed to use this article as a source for their information. So that's obviously going to decrease novelty in some ways, simply because they may be repeating some of the words from the article itself. So they can use the article. So why did we choose the essay for this uh, portion? Well, it allows students free production. So you're, you're writing without guidance other than the essay topics, which I'll come to in a moment. And the essay topics that we choose from year to year are just things that are uh, on the zeitgeist, things that are interesting to students or people in general. So for this particular data set that we're looking at, we used uh, the drinking age. Should we lower the drinking age in New Zealand? So as you'll uh, expect, drinking age will have a high frequency um, simply because that is our topic. And there are other words which will suggest or trigger um, something to follow. For example, university in our context frequently will be followed by Otago of Otago because there are of Otago students. Similarly, New will uh, suggest Zealand uh, quite frequently rather than say New Hampshire or New York. Uh, but there will be some other words that appear in our corpus uh, simply because we've suggested them in the text. And these might be low frequency words in other corpora in general, such as homicide or drinking age. So we gave them two options uh, as we do on every test for, uh, for what they should write on. One is uh, changing the drinking age and uh, another is designing a new study. Now, We've done a lot of previous re research on this, cor uh, on this corpus in general. The first thing we did was uh, we're trying to find out uh, how to help students. That's our main goal. And we started looking at uh, the types of errors that students are making. Uh, and this was more of a manual process because it wasn't digitized and we didn't have a parts of speech tagger for, for these portions yet. So what we found were students were making a lot of mechanical errors uh, when they were taking this English diagnostic test. Roughly every second sentence had some sort of error in it. And in particular, they were having problems with complete sentences, even though they were given instructions like write a complete sentence, use a capital letter, full stop, have subject and verb, and given an example of what a complete sentence might be. And that had a significant, that was uh, st statistically significant in terms of getting into health uh, science programs. If you made errors grammatically, you were less likely to get into one of the desired programs. And of course, we realized that it had probably had very little to do with uh, grammar itself. We were identifying something about the types of students that we had. So, uh, so the next thing we tried was reflection on failure. So. What we mean by this is if you fail this test initially, you get a chance to sit it a second time. And that might simply be because um, you failed because you were experiencing test anxiety. And there are motivations to come and review. For example, you can improve on the test. The test is an artifact, the only artifact from the testing process. Um, you, you don't want to fail a second time because then you can't take an elective. And what we found was students, uh, we had quite a few students who reviewed, but we had a significant number of students who did not review. And that was revealing something about the type of students they were. So when we looked at their mean marks across their study, what we found was students who reviewed were uh, scoring significantly higher across their papers than were students who did not review. So indeed we were identifying a type of student and we looked to socioeconomic markers. So we started, look, Decile's an easy one. For those of you who don't know Decile, it's the school funding bracket. Uh, it doesn't really tell us much about individual students. And we looked at that a little bit more later. What it doesn't indicate is the performance of students or the quality of education. It's only the socioeconomic background of those who go to the university. And what we found was, or to the high school, sorry. And what we found was that uh, students who went to low decile schools, low socioeconomically funded schools, um, were scoring uh, at their highest point in reading about the same as the lowest scoring students from private schools. So we, it was, we were identifying socioeconomic problems. And this persisted uh, throughout uh, the, the different ranges of decile. 
So we realized quite quickly what the di English diagnostic might be measuring, a combination of academic preparedness. Uh, it's measuring family background, and it's also in some ex to some extent measuring academic skills. But we wanted to know if it was measuring something about how students express themselves and how they might be doing it novelly. Thank you for the transition, I guess. Is it the down arrow? For yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so what Michael's presented is intended to let you know where the data is coming from. And um, once we saw that we had, well, um, you know, roughly 1,400 people, <laughs> ideally, uh, all talking about the same thing, we decided that we needed to investigate um, what the, what what they're bringing to the topic, um, and if that can give us clues about um, how to actually encourage uh, creativity and novelty. So what this is mostly going to be about today, what I'm presenting, is our work so far in trying to figure out if we can computationally discover a novelty in a corpus. Um, so the sorts of questions that are related to that we might ask are, do we all say the same thing on a topic? So if you've been marking or grading essays for a long time, you might wonder after you've read 10 student essays, is it worth reading anymore if you actually wanted to learn something or are they all just saying the same thing to you over and over again? But this is of course more broadly interesting because um, you know, you could have people all around the world talking about some uh, interesting critical thing of the day. And is there some way to find people who are saying something different about it? Um, what is the variation? Can we find people saying novel things computationally? And for a future work, really, can you then encourage that novel idea generation? And what I'm really going to be doing today is this one here, mostly like 80%, 90%, which is can we find people saying novel things? And then a little bit of do we all say the same thing? Right, so I've been, we've been talking about this or calling this what we're data we're using a deep corpus, um, and the deep corpus is just the student essays in this case so far, very short ones as you'll see soon, um, and it's deep corpus in the sense that uh, it's a whole bunch of people all talking about the same thing, rather than something like uh, the British National Corpus or something the Wellington Corpus, which is hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of people all talking about different things. Uh, so this is just now just to introduce you a little bit more to the corpus. So far, this is in progress in many ways, but it's in progress just in transcribing. Um, we've transcribed over 800 essays so far, we being Caleb and Lisa mostly, um, which has given us about almost 200,000 word tokens, um, 6,600 word types. It's not really word types. What is right now, it's just unique words. Um, so it's not lexical. Uh, families or anything like that yet, we'll get there. Uh, 9,000 sentences and 22 words on average per sentence. Um, this becomes, so I wanted to look here to see basically, are we getting to be a fairly sizable corpus? And if it is a fairly sizable corpus, you would expect it generally to follow a power law or the Zip, Zip's law distribution. And that's a, what I was just looking at here. So. Uh, on a log log scale on the right, if it was a perfect power law, the um, frequency of the words would follow that blue line perfectly. It follows it pretty closely, but uh, does veer off. And we'll talk about why very soon. Yeah, just a quick content warning that I think we've hit some of the words already. Um, they are, there's terms about self-harm and violence in the data because of the topic. Right, so if you just look at raw frequencies, a lot of what you see in our corpus is exactly what you'd expect about any English corpus. So there's, was it 19,000 words or something like that? Uh, no, 190,000 words, 11,000 of the words are just the word the over and over again. Um, but very quickly after the, to, and of, you start seeing things that are not to be expected in a general corpus like drinking, age, new alcohol, Zealand, and of course, that's because we asked them all to write about the drinking age in New Zealand. If you take away those uh, stop words or sort of function words, uh, then these are the common words. I won't read them all, but it's the topic. Drinking age, alcohol, Zealand, 18, study, people, suicide, culture, etc. Okay, so that's cool. But really, this is not where we're going. What this is saying is what everyone is saying. 
all those most common words are just the topic of the essay. Um, where we want to go is, can we now search within this for novel contributions, or at least as a starting point, identifying essays that are more novel on the topic than other essays? And I haven't, we haven't yet found anyone doing this exactly, and we can, we'll be talking about why a little bit. So this is exploratory. We're trying to find a measure. Um, so the first thing, of course, is to say anything new, um, you have to say anything, you have to say something. Um, so our very first measure is just, you know, do you say anything? And so if you say more stuff, you're more likely to be saying new things. Um, oh, that's a weird thing. Okay. Um, so what's it look like? Uh, the On average, we have 123 word types in a sentence. The minimum is eight words. Actually, it was nine word essay, but eight word types. Um, and the maximum is 229. Word token wise, it's 240, mean the shortest essay was nine words. They only wrote a sentence and stopped. And the longest is almost 500. So it was 123 words in an essay mean uh, not in the sentence. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so they're fairly short things, and that could be influencing um, our results, of course. Um, but that's just very basic. You have to say something to say novel things. So how do you identify what's novel? Um, so one thing we've been trying is uh, saying unusual things, i.e. trying to identify rare words. And in particular, we actually were most interested in rare words within the corpus i.e. so this isn't going to be just comparing a word in, our, in an essay against the Wellington New Zealand corpus or British National Corpus or something. It's going to be comparing the word in an essay against all of their compatriots sitting in the room taking the test. All right, so the first measure, and this can be something of the question, the Q&A later, um, that we've tried is defining rare as only used seven times out of the 825 essays. Uh, a great question you should be having right now, if you're interested in this, is why seven? Why not six or ten or two? Um, and this is very difficult. I am not. I do not have a principled way. I didn't want to use one, though. I'll come back to that because an idea can be unusual without being unique. Um, and then all the numbers above it weren't making much difference. Uh, my standard deviation would be a natural sort of thing to try but there's a lot of variation in small numbers and that just doesn't work. Uh, so right now I'm using seven. It's kind of just pulled out of, it looks nice. Um, right, so based upon that measure of rare words, uh, on average, an essay, no matter, even, if, even though they're only a couple hundred words long, has almost 10 rare words in it. Uh, the minimum is zero. There's a few essays where they didn't say anything that no one else had said frequently, fairly frequently. Uh, and the maximum, amazingly, is 39 rare words uh, just in a single essay. Okay. Um, now, the problem with just counting rare words is that, of course, that the more you write, the more likely you are to say something rare. So it could just be we're counting the exact same thing. More words equals more rare words. So as an attempt, and it'd be great in Q&A again if you have a better idea for it. Um, I forget about that. Uh, as an attempt to handle normalize for that, we just turn the rare words into a rate. So divide the number of rare words by the total uh, word count. And what you get out of that is that um, on average across all the essays, about one out of every 14 words occurs less than seven times throughout the entire almost 900 essay corpus. Uh, there are some with um, zero words, and I'm a maximum of 25%. So this would indicate 25% of the word types they used are rare. Um, that can be misleading, of course, because if you have a very short essay, which happens to be unusual, you might not be saying very much, but no one else said it. Um, interestingly, even after you sort of create the word, rare word rate, um, if you just map it against um, your number of word types, um, there's still a relationship. So people who are able in the 20 minutes they have to write this essay to generate a lot 
are also generating a lot of rare words even after you divide it by the number of words they created. All right, so we're still though just looking at individual words. Oops. Um, so if, yeah, so still looking at individual words, what kind of rare words exist? What are the, one of the ones, one of the types that's gonna eventually go away when we finish the research is misspellings. So if they misspell the word right now, it looks like it's a rare word, but that will go away when the data's corpus is prepared properly. Um, another course type of rare word is just rare words that are generally rare across the language. So one that showed up in our data is bombast. And it's not clear why bombast came up in the middle of drinking age discussion, but it did. And this is rare across the language. Um, just to point out, I did take a look at the most common way to look at unusual stuff, which uh, Joshua also used, um, which is the TF-IDF measure, and so token frequency inverse. And I just did, I compared our corpus against the British national corpus. Um, and we see, well, what we expect, which is homicide, adolescence, New Zealand, binge, because binge drinking, we're talking about, right? Underage, homicide again, spelled different ways, um, et cetera. This is actually, this is useful, but mostly it's just telling us kind of the topic of the essay more than what's different about individual things. So the TF-IDF doesn't really help us too much. Okay, so, um, so, far, so far everything has been individual words. How about, you know, you don't just say individual words, you have to put them into sequences, right? Um, oops forgetting my things. Uh, so one last type of rare word, this actually is the most interesting, um, is the ones that are very common in the language, but happen not to have been used very often. And I think the reason those are the most interesting is because everyone probably knows these words, but only some people decided to actually bring them to their argument. Okay, finally, what I keep going into too early, um, you do also want to look at putting words together, not just individual words. So what we decided to try here, um, is, forget about the animations, anyway, um, surprisal. So um, this is finally where the graph theoretic stuff starts to come in a bit. We wanted to find unusual sequences of words um, as well as just un unusual words. Uh, so the surprisal is the measure that we are considering. And I will define that now. <laughs> um, so this is just a graph. So the kind of graph we've created for this is not a semantic network or anything like that. That would be something that is on the, on the table to do later. It's purely a graph of each word is a node in the graph and it links to, if it's the next, you have word one, if word two is next to it, then there's a link between the two. So this is unlabeled because it's giant, but like I, that's the, the in the middle, essentially. Um, and so we turned everything into a graph with step one. Uh, and then we just started creating um, surprisal. So this is a measure that comes out of information theory. It's used for a lot of syntax. Uh, Roger Levy is associated with it. How do you calculate it? You take a word. Um, then looking through the sorting, finding, sorting through the graph, these are all bigrams. Um, you find all the words that follow it in the corpus, not generally, but just in the corpus. You calculate the probability of each of those words. So looking at my example here, this would not be the example, but just convenient numbers. If the word N is followed by new, as in in New Zealand, 20 times, but followed by the five times and some five times, um, then you can get the surprise of I, just taking the frequency, so five out of 30 or 20 out of 30. Um, and then the surprise measure is you take the negative log value. When you do that, um, essentially the things that are more common get a smaller value and the things that are least common get a higher value of surprise. Um, and there you go. Now that's going to be just a surprisal per bigram. Basically, how about for an essay? For that, we then just summed up over all of the edges or all of the bigrams. And again, if you have longer um, essay, you're going to have 
a higher sum. So we'd normalize by the number of words again. Um, and then you can divide it by that. So that's the final measure. Promising, in a promising way, all three of these things I've defined, which is the number of word types, number of rare words, or sorry, the rare word rate and surprisal rate all, all correlate uh, so that uh, unusual words, of course, create unusual sequences and all of them correlate with word types. One interesting thing, this echoes back to what Michael said, is that a way a lot of this research started before we looked at this particular topic is trying to figure out whether or not our test is really helpful in helping students and that sort of thing. Um, we're doing good. Yeah. And so I looked, we looked at whether or not um, their NCA, basically, their entry NCA entry is predictive of how they do at um, both in our test and at the University of Mark. On the left, that's what we're seeing. If people have good NCA results or Cambridge results or IB type results, they do well at, at uni. However, and this sort of stuff occurs over and over and over in our data, when you look at um, the surprisal stuff, there's no relationship at all. So doing well in university, at least in the first semester of health sciences papers, uh, doesn't seem to have a direct relationship to saying anything different um, in the essays. All right. Um, and our final measure, and we'll be wrapping up, is it's nice to have a rare word. You know, so someone used the word cheap, or three, say three people used the word cheap, and then the other 895 did not. But so what? <laughs> what does it mean to be important? Uh, what does it mean to, is it important? Is it, does anyone care that someone happened to use a word like cheap? Um, one thing we probably cannot do with our current data is decide what's important for the world. Uh, you know, some external measure, we just don't have it. But we might be able to decide if a word is important for the essay. So it'd be one thing if they use a rare word in the periphery, but it makes no real difference to what they're arguing. But another thing, if it's a central, syntactically central within the essay. So we did a centrality measure, which is a graph theoretic measure. And this is just sort of a sample. You can see some things. Um, so this is our just examples of essays that have high centrality and rare words. All right. So to wrap things up, what have we come up with to be novel? One, more word types. Two, higher word rate. Three, um, having a high centrality, so we just covered within those rare words, and having a higher surprisal rate. The hypothesis, I guess, is that um, essays with all of these things are very likely to be novel. Let me finish up. Yeah. Um, but, and this is sort of where we're gonna stop for the Q&A, it might be a reasonable measure, but is it the right measure? How do we know that these are actually find anything? Um, so that's where we need to be going next, which is we need an external measure to test this against or in some way validate what we're doing. All right, thank you very much. Great, uh, thanks for that, Hunter and Michael. Uh, now we've got uh, uh, Elaine Moody from the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences uh, at Flinders University uh, joining us, but uh, she's actually joining us from Montreal where it's uh, 10 p.m. in the evening. So uh, we're extending our time zones uh, with this uh, with this session today. So um, welcome uh, to Elaine and um, over to you. Super. Um, I take it you can see my screen. Great. Okay, so I am joining you from Chochaka, Chochake, which is the Ganyankaha or Mohawk name for the city of Montreal. I am an immigrant of European descent, working, living and raising my kids on unceded indigenous territory. I acknowledge my duty to reconcile with and be an ally to the indigenous people in my region and around the world as we collectively deconstruct colonial systems and cultivate social and ecological justice for all and for many generations to come. Um, so the, um, oops, there we go. 
Uh, the subject of this study is human migration, which can take many forms that tend to be treated categorically, often as binaries. Migrants move domestically or internationally. Their movements are voluntary or forced, their settlement permanent or temporary. The research I'm about to present follows the advice of world historians Patrick Manning and Tiffany Trimmer to imagine that all the elements of migration can be formed into a multidimensional grid extending in many different directions. One such access, migrant agency, would range from free to unfree, replacing categories like skilled labor, refugee, indentured servant, displaced person, and slave. Jan and Leo Lucasen, along with Manning, describe such typologies as unproductive when they develop into exclusive dichotomies that make comparisons irrelevant, thus obstructing the tracing of possible similarities as well as uncovering what is indeed different between these groups. This study focuses on a subset of migrants, that is 19th century European immigrants in North America who wrote letters, which then survived to be included in a machine readable archive. This collection of letters suffers from the same kinds of biases as many other digital cultural data sets. Black and indigenous voices are absent, poor and female migrants are underrepresented. However, imagining these artifacts and the experiences they encode within a multidimensional grid, free from severe typologies, might allow us to model what those missing voices might have told us. Uh, understanding migration experiences is important because migration affects countless people the world over. According to the International Organization for Migration, the number of international migrants more than tripled between 1970 and 2019. And projections show sustained levels over the next several decades with the effects of global warming and climate change, potentially raising the number of migrants motivated by environmental concerns alone to 1 billion in 2050. The research I'm presenting today was a direct response to the 2018 World Migration Report which called for research that involves listening to and learning from migrants for the purpose of supporting migration policy. Of particular concern was understanding the experiences of people of fewer means and more restricted choices who are most likely to find themselves in a situation of vulnerability. So what is known about this material? Migrant letters captured the attention of Western scholars towards the end of World War I. It was a team of sociologists that brought them into the spotlight. But while the social science community debated the empirical value of personal documents, historians embraced them as giving narrative life to statistical facts and figures. Concurrent with and part of the new social history movement, these scholars began producing edited collections of migrant letters beginning in the mid 1950s. A subset of scholars became more empirical in their approaches and by the late 20th century, they were using methodologies inspired by narrative inquiry and content analysis to categorize texts, describe the structure of letters and identify thematic patterns and keywords. They were beginning to envision migrant letters as the object of statistical procedures rather than addressing on them. The computational turn in the humanities has further entwined the interdisciplinary approaches to studying the migrant letter with most technologically oriented work now being conducted in the fields of corpus linguistics and the digital humanities. Throughout, qualitative and critical work on personal letters has been generated within the humanities, especially in the field of autobiographical studies. Despite the range of research paradigms guiding the scholarly work, some recurrent themes are apparent. I'll focus on three of these today. The letters of Irish Catholic migrants were more negative than those of other Anglophone migrants, such as the British, who were more culturally invisible. Early letters reflect an aversion to modernizing forces, such as industrialization and a yearning for an autonomous agrarian lifestyle. And letter sentiment became more negative in the mid to 19th century. Oops. Okay, so, um, what gap does my study fill? Uh, my contribution, um, which has, okay, so what does my contribution to this material, which has already been well studied by researchers using a wide range of methods, including some forms of computational analysis, uh, what, do, what does my study add? In an effort to integrate the social science and humanistic perspectives that characterize the study of migrant letters, I examine the degree to which narrative features, specifically topics and sentiments, vary by time, place, and author traits. And I do this using regression analysis conducted in the Bayesian framework, which Underwood and Weingart have recommended for humanists. For those interested in this alternative form of statistics, I would highly recommend Richard McElroy's statistical rethinking book and his online lectures. 
I can personally attest to this form of statistics being more intuitive to learn and to the results being more straightforward to communicate. So the data set in this study comprises 915 letters sent between 1789 and 1914 by 218 first generation immigrants in North America. The letters were extract extracted from the Alexander Street Press database called North American Immigrant Letters, Diaries and Oral Histories. The texts are in English, either originally or through translation, and they came to me as machine readable TXT files accompanied by two Excel spreadsheets containing metadata about the documents and authors. The overarching methodology used in this study was exploratory data analysis with specific methods, including sentiment analysis, topic modeling, and Bayesian linear regression, all executed in Jupyter notebooks using Python and R programming languages. Sentiment was measured using, using Vader. Topics were modeled using the Mallet implementation of Leighton Dirichlet allocation in Gensum. These two graphs show the gender and location distributions for the group of writers and the letter collection. The graph on the right illustrates an important feature of the data set. Some writers wrote more than one letter. In particular, three prolific women produced 46% of the letters in the collection. Their large contribution biases the data in one sense, but balances gender and country distributions in another. This feature of the data set needed to be kept in mind throughout the analysis. Uh, these two graphs provide an overview of the biographical characteristics of the letter writers. I don't have time to go through these in detail, but what they illustrate is that the data set includes a diversity of ages, genders, cultural backgrounds, and occupational classes, but with uneven levels of representation. The mean sentiment score for the data set was 0.16, which is mildly positive on the Vader scale. The series of graphs on this slide show a subtle decline in positivity over the 19th century, but increases both with the passage of time since migration and writer age. I don't offer detailed information for each of these graphs, but I will interpret the first one for the sake of demonstrating how the results of the Bayesian regressions are communicated. So for that first graph, for each standard deviation increase in time, equivalent to 21 years, the average letter, letter sentiment is expected to decrease by 0.03 units on the Vader scale. To put this in context, it would take 63 years or until 1928 for the average sentiment score to dip into the neutral range on the Vader scale. Excuse me. Um, this slide looks at the relationship between sentiment and gender. The first regression model did not show a gender difference as seen in the first graph, but it also did not account for the fact that some authors wrote more than one letter. One of the advantages of Bayesian linear modeling is that it is conducive to building multi-level models which in this case allowed me to tease out the effect of gender without discarding data, that is by sampling a single letter from each writer. The second graph shows the results of the multi-level model, which reveal not only that female authored letters are less positive than male authored letters, but that the sentiment scores of the three prolific female authors represented by the red dots in the graph are more like those of the average male author than the average female author. I don't have time to discuss the results for the religion, national origin, and occupational class variables, but in summary, they show that Protestant and English authorship, as well as membership in the agricultural class, was more positive, while letters from immigrants in the United States and in the industrial class were less positive. Again, this is not to be confused with negative. In general, the letters remained almost entirely in the mildly positive realm. These are very subtle distant differences. I ran the topic model on the whole letters using a range of values for the number of topics parameter. The 21 topic model was selected because it had one of the higher, uh, one of the best coherence scores, good intertopic distances, and it reflected roughly the number of topics reported by Moritin, which were used as a guide when assigning labels to keyword lists. The topics aligned well with those reported by Moritin and other migrant letter scholars in that they were oriented around practical matters such as farming and money, relationship maintenance, maintenance such as family and friends and recollection and local affairs, such as news and events and daily life. However, some suggested contemplation about broader, more abstract subjects, such as modernization. The distribution of letter topics varied most notably by gender and country. Men wrote more about farming and women about recollection with American immigrants writing less about both topics as well as the topic of family and friends which were the three highest scoring for sentiment as shown in the following slide. 
The findings are largely in line with previous scholarship on migrant correspondence, particularly with regards to prominent narratives about visibility and industrialization. The quantitative techniques revealed subtle patterns, especially around gender, and they offered insight into how Bayesian modeling might address the problem of female and minority underrepresentation in cultural data sets, which is the principal limitation of this study. That's it. Great. Um, thanks to all the, yep. Um, yeah, let's show our appreciation on Zoom uh, for, for all the presenters in whichever way you want to. Um, thank you. Um, uh, thanks to all the presenters. Uh, and great, great to uh, everyone uh, keeping to time there. Um, and there's some great connections between uh, these, uh, these papers. So uh, we'll move to questions now. Um, how we'll uh, have that work is uh, you can type uh, uh, your question or if you if you want to ask a question into, into chat uh, or you can use the raise hand feature and we'll uh, we'll um, call on you um, and obviously the the various pre presenters today might have questions and I know uh, my colleague uh, Chris Thompson who's the admin today uh, he, he he might have some questions as well so um, let, uh, let's Get into it. I can start uh, a question here. Um, so an interesting uh, aspect of the papers is that in some ways uh, these are all applications of uh, modeling language to reach at some other phenomena reflected through text. Um, so Josh, uh, these are historical questions about philosophy. Uh, Hunter and Michael, these this idea of novel ideas, um, but you know, really helping uh, with uh, with the progress of students as well, and Elaine uh, sentiment and topics. Um, so one of the things we often background in talking and writing about this kind of research are the texts and the creators of the texts themselves, and how these methods can function as a way to get closer to texts and the people that populate them. Um, so uh, my question: uh, How have these methods that abstract and quantify language? Got you closer to the text and your and the narratives and histories and in the case of uh, Hunter and Michael, the people that uh, you're dealing with. What have you found uh, in your corporate that, that that's informing your research? Uh, and 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 what uh, has this added really added to your research and, and this kind of moves moves between quantitative and qualitative uh, readings uh, of your of your corpora. So. Uh, that's a, a question. Can, can I open that uh, up to you all? Maybe starting with Josh. Uh, sorry, don't have my microphone up. There we go. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I suppose um, I came into the project that I've been looking at with almost no sense of who the the sort of figures at, at play would be and, and how... Um, you know, the various sort of issues I was interested in um, sort of played out. And just constantly, I suppose, the main thing that I was getting was sort of unknown names popping out at me all over the place that sort of led to all sorts of different, um, uh, yeah, the things that were surprising to me. I had no idea how massive, say, the, the Theosophical Society was in public lectures. Um, and and indeed in the way in which a lot of like 19th century kind of idealist philosophical ideas really were like where the rubber met the road it wasn't sort of uh just sort of scholarly monographs there were also you know there was a weird pantheist kind of cult set up in Christchurch by this guy <laughs> Worthington who I'd never heard of and so there's a whole interesting story about how how those ideas end up um, playing out on the ground. But yeah, that, that's enough for me, probably. That's great. great. Uh, Michael, uh, Hunter and Michael, have you got something to add there? Uh, one of the interests we were just discussing, one of the interesting things, I'm just going to screen share this really quickly, and you saw it in our presentation, was that, um, sorry, I've got the wrong one up. Uh, one of the things you saw in our presentation was that culture appeared uh, when we did it quantitatively in, in terms of drinking. And this was something that I experienced when I was qualitatively sampling these uh, on the topic. So one of, uh, one of my interests is, uh, for those of you who know anything about Otago, is the 
uh, drinking culture here and how the university sells itself uh, many t uh, quite frequently. And one of the things that I recognized was students were identifying drinking as an integral part of New Zealand culture, one that can't be removed. And by lowering the drinking age, you would somehow be damaging the cultural fabric. And uh, finding it as in one of the um, uh, screen one there we go. Finding it in the list of can you see that? Sorry, are you seeing my browser? Are you seeing my my screen? We're seeing sorry. a view of your PowerPoint with the yeah. It's not, so it's you not can see screen, how, yeah. how frequent culture actually yeah, was yeah. in the uh, when when we were uh, analyzing, and that's not necessarily to do with our novelty specifically, but this is reveal, uh, revealing something about how our students view drinking in general. So that, mm -hmm. that was a side aspect of it. And uh, I think that anyone who knows something about Otago probably wouldn't find that too surprising. Too surprising. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing, of course, is just the eventual goal is to be able to find if there are voices who are being marginalized, is there a way to find them so that we can get them at the attention that should be uh, sent that direction in some computational way? Now we're still at the very beginnings of getting there, but that's that, that's a hope, yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, all of our goals are largely based towards helping students. So, um, again, and that's, uh, that's also a cultural aspect in a different sense that uh, certain, uh, identified groups tend to speak up less frequently mm. and being able to uh, being able to help them in some computational way. Mm. That's great. Uh, Elaine, have you, have you got uh, something to add here? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, so I felt very connected to the texts that I studied computationally and quantitatively, but I also felt very connected through the literature review to the scholars that have been studying migrant letters using a variety of methods over the years. And it was so interesting and I don't know, just gratifying to see some of their ideas flesh out in these like strictly quantitative, um, through these quant like strictly quantitative methods that they probably would have never envisioned their, their ideas being shown in, through that in that way. The other way that I connected was with the actual writers of the letters. I mean, these are personal letters, very, um, I'm, an, I'm an immigrant in Canada um, and I moved to Canada from Australia and I had a bit of a hard time adjusting to the weather. So I, I initially did the, the research where everything was done quantitatively, but then after the research was done, I picked up the memoir of one of those three prolific writers and her name is Susanna Moody, which is very similar to my name, which is Susanna Lane Moody. And uh, I really connected with her. Like her mm -hmm. experiences just made me feel like um, I really should just stop complaining about the weather. Because <laughs> <laughs> yes. her life was way harder. Yeah, yeah. well, um, thanks, thanks for that. Uh, now, um, has, has anyone else uh, got any uh, questions for the presenters? Have the presenters got questions for each other? I can see, uh, I'll, I'll invite uh, Hunter and Michael to, to ask a question there. I've got a question uh, both for Elaine and for Josh. Um, uh, one was, uh, I, I, that slide went by quickly, Elaine. I was wondering, you mentioned cultural diversity. Uh, I was wondering if it was largely European cultural diversity and if that speaks to literacy in some way. And we're also wondering about how you determine uh, positivity. Was that sentiment? Was that through a sentiment, a sentiment analysis database, or how did you? How was that determined? Um, so, first question about the diversity. Yes, yes, very much all European. There was one person, one writer in the database who the metadata showed as being African but was actually somebody who was a European settler in Africa who had actually then moved to North America. So yes, very white, not uh, much um, diversity outside of Europe. But within Europe, there was, you know, there were people who were Jewish. So that was the thing that kind of came up was that this sort of culturally 
visible migrants that were having more negative experiences were those who were Jewish as opposed to Christian. Okay. Yeah. Um, and, and then in terms of the second question, in terms of positivity, so um, I was using the Vader sentiment analysis um, lexicon, and there's also some um, like rules that are in, included in the, the package. So it was um, done through Vader using the standard lexicon. Um, although I did remove 19th century stop words that had been identified by jockers. Uh, so those were removed from the um, analysis, but then it was just using the Vader lexicon to, to score the sentiment. And that is, I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, the um, Vader, tool, but basically there are human coders who go through and, and score the words in the lexicon. And then there's also an algorithmic um, algorithm that applies rules to the scores. So like a sentence, for example, would be the um, sum of all the scores in the sentence normalized. Um, and then also there would be these rules that are applied to sort of adjust the score. So like, you know, not great would not be scored very positively if you have not and great together. Thank you. And uh, just a quick one for Josh, if you don't mind. Uh, we're, uh, does, uh, when you were doing your label, labeling, are you at the labeling stage? Um, does it give genre or metadata? So for example, editorial versus sports writing versus letters to the editor versus short stories. Um, uh, or does it give other information like where the author originates? So, for example, pur purchased letters uh, that come from uh, a bigger associated press or that are locally created or that are in-house produced. Is there any of that type of metadata? No, that, that metadata is, isn't available in, um, in the initial data set. And I did do some things towards... Um, uh, uh, well, I, I tried at least initially in my labeling process to see if I could identify um, material as either um, just by my manually sort of looking at it, identify it as either um, written here or bought from overseas. But I, I gave up on that eventually. I've still got some labeling there, but it's sort of hard to tell. Um, and so that, that could be work in progress. But um, on in terms of the genre stuff, that's, yeah, that's not there apart from the advertisement and article distinction. Um, and even then there are advertisements that I found and what I've got. So the labeling's not always reliable, but um, I know there is someone in the core who's just in the initial stages of starting to work on this, um, uh, that question of um, classifying by genre in the starter set. So that will be really exciting to see what they come up with. Right. Um, now we've got a couple of questions that have come through chat. Uh, uh, is it Tiani? Uh, would you like to ask your question on uh, over mic, or would you like me to read it for you? Perhaps I read it. Uh, this is a question for Elaine. You mentioned that so far your findings generally correlate with what has previously been written about uh, in migrant letters. Are there any significant differences you've found so far? or things you weren't expecting? Um, so there was one very prominent theme that was sort of mentioned by a lot of, of scholars of migrant letters. And that was this idea that migrant, 19th century migrant letters are formulaic, whereby the introduction to the letter is very ceremonial and is using a lot of formal language it's almost like a bow to elders and that kind of thing. And that, um, you know, this, the center part of the letter was more intimate and that's where the meat of things were. And then the, the, the end would be again, sort of ceremonial. So I was, I was kind of expecting to, I, so in addition to all of the modeling and sentiment scoring that I did on the basis of the whole letter, I also did the same thing sentence by sentence. And I looked to see whether or not there were, like, you know, um, there was any trend or any sort of relationship between the position of a sentence in a letter and the sentiment score or the kind of topics that were reflected. And I didn't find anything. So um, 
that's not to say that all of those scholars are wrong. You know, it's just that maybe my techniques weren't able to identify or detect that kind of structure. It's something to look into some more. Um, so yeah, I would say that would be the one thing that I was kind of surprised by. Right. Uh, so we've got a question from Kate Knox. Um, I think Kate's gonna ask that. Uh, yeah, thanks. Kia ora everyone. Um, I was just wondering, Elaine, um, were there any like political or religious refugees included in the migrant uh, pools? Like I know it can be quite hard to distinguish um, which migrants would be refugees or not, but I was just wondering if there were if there was a clear distinction there. And um, if so, where were they from? And was there anything interesting about those findings? So um, for sure, there would have been some. Um, it would take a, a little bit more historical contextualization than what I did in my thesis in order to identify those, because I'd have to go you know, country by country during the entirety of the 19th century to figure out where conflicts were happening. But for sure, like there are, I think that there are there are Russians in the data set who are probably um, fleeing like the like like the pogroms or like fleeing like uh, cultural and uh, religious sort of conflict there, for sure. Um, the there were Jewish people in the data set who were probably also fleeing some kind of persecution. And also a lot of um, the settlement, uh, European settlement in the United States and Canada was uh, around religious freedom. So even Christian, like even within Protestant, Protestantism, there were like people who were fleeing persecution because their beliefs didn't match the predominant ones. So yes, but that's not something that I focused on in my study, but it would be really interesting to do. Right, well, that, that uh, links to the last question, which I'm going to ask uh, you all. Um, we've heard about this particular research, um, what you've presented today. It'd be great to hear a little bit how that fits into your research agenda, uh, what your next steps are, and what you're how you're hoping to develop uh, your research uh, from here. Uh, maybe start with, with Josh again. Uh, yeah, well, I suppose the natural thing here is I, I've sort of been very much focused on, like, presenting a kind of method for generating specialized corpora, it would be great to sort of actually find the time to um, really get into detail with the corpus that I've produced. And um, uh, and in indeed, there's sort of uh, some open questions there um, about what can be found in terms of um, how people from outside of the academy are, are interacting with them, um, with these ideas. So that that would be fun. Um, and also um, uh, highlighting sort of um, what's being discussed in that kind of public lecture kind of thing, which is, I suppose, is kind of like the way podcasts are now. It's sort of one of the main ways that the general public interacts with kind of intellectual sort of ideas. But yeah. Uh, Hunter and Michael? Are oh, you muted? Yeah. 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 Um, well, a very practical one is we have to finish transcribing because <laughs> uh, there's actually 1,400 essays and we're only you know 800 in, fixed problem with the data set. Um, bigger scale, uh, um, a definite next step would also be collecting things that score high on our novelty and some essays that score low on the novelty and then trying to compare them uh, just actually by reading them finally and seeing if we can actually see differences when we actually see the content. And then also there's a, it's an online um, set of essays of another thousand people or so of much longer length that was created for people who want to do automated grading and things, but seeing if it's possible to extend um, our measures out and test them against actual different data and such mm -hmm. are a couple of different ways to go. And also we're, we'll, we intend to be checking, we reuse tests from time to time we intend to be checking our 2014 against our 2020 when that essay was repeated to see if there are any major shifts in um, in the way people are thinking or talking about those ideas. Very interesting. Right, and uh, Elaine? Uh, right, so I'm, um, I've now started a PhD at Flinders and I'm 
just getting started on a project that is looking at trying to connect this sort of 20th century idea that's been developed in sort of economics and psychology, um, sociology around the idea of subjective well-being or life satisfaction or happiness. Mm -hmm. Maybe you've heard of some of these terms and connecting that to historical life writing. So to look to see whether or not we can see any signal of that kind of uh, idea or measure it somehow in historical letters or diaries, those kinds of, so that's, that's where I'm heading. Great, I, um, well, um, I think that's time to wind up the session. Um, uh, a, a reminder that coming up at 6 uh, p.m. New Zealand time, uh, there's a great panel on Digital Humanities Labs chaired by uh, Chris Thompson and Ursula Paliki uh, Dega. The chairs are, um, are editing a book on Digital Humanities Labs and the panelists are people contributing chapters to that edited volume. And uh, so, so I attend that this evening. Um, Chris Thompson, who, who is chairing that event, has been admining this session and moderating the chat. chat so uh, thanks to him. Um, thanks also to our DHA tech support, uh, Lauren Miller. Um, and thanks to Jennifer and uh, Natalie and the conference organizing committee and everyone else who's, who's helped putting, uh, put this uh, excellent panel together. Um, but most of all, uh, thanks to all the, the presenters. Um, it's been a, a very interesting uh, panel and, and, and it's great to hear the direction of this research as well. Um, we've learned a lot and uh, best wishes for your progress with this research. So um, please show your appreciation uh, in whatever zoomy way uh, you can. Um, yeah, and you can unmute and, uh, and, and clap if you want, whatever you want to do. Um, but we'll sign off the session now. And uh, that's it. Um, ka kite anō.